Cygnet Conferometer that I'm going to describe today is the most sensitive one that I've built to date. What's different about this one as compared to the others is that we've gone to a much longer Sagnac loop. Uh, this time we've got a one kilometer single mode fiber as the loop. And uh, other parts of it are very similar to, to the previous designs. We're still using the 2x2 two two coupler with 50 50 uh, light going through each side and with a polarization controller um, loop uh, connected on one side of the uh, fiber optic cable. And we're also using an amplifier after the detector, but this time we're using a uh, common mode rejection amplifier, which then connects to the oscilloscope. And the idea is to uh, get better noise figure on the amplifier um, as compared to the previous designs that we've used. So those are the main changes uh, with this current setup. What I've got to show next is the schematic of the common mode rejection amplifier. And the strategy here is to take the uh, pin diode signal, which is uh, shown above. One is the reference from uh, the internals of the laser, and the other one is at the end of the 2x2 uh, two two coupler, which receives the signals coming back from the loop. And uh, we put each of these diodes connected to either arm of the common mode uh, inputs. The idea being that they will cancel out uh, some of the common mode noise between the two and also will help control for intensity drift on the laser. So uh, this amplifier gives a total amplification of between about 500 times and 1150 times depending upon the gain. And it also allows us to zero um, the signal uh, by uh, uh, balancing the voltages between the two diodes. The fully assembled electro-optic interface is shown in this figure here. This is the completed Sagnac interferometer. It is on an equatorial mount so that it can be positioned in any direction horizontally or vertically with respect to the rotating earth. For our Sagnac interferometer to experience the full rotation of the earth, we have to align it so that its z-axis is parallel to the north pole. Once it's in this alignment, which is shown in the figure here, it experiences the full rotation of the earth at one revolution per day. If, however, we turn the device perpendicular to the uh, axis of the pole, as shown here, it will experience no rotation at all. In this next graphic of the Earth, you can see the two orientations of the Sagnac interferometer. The one with the axis parallel to the North Pole being the one that will experience the most rotation, and the one with the axis perpendicular, the one that will experience no rotation. And we choose these two because we're going to flip between each orientation so that we can see the maximum change in fringe shift from one orientation to the other. These are just some pictures showing the Sagnac interferometer in some actual orientations. This first one is with the z-axis parallel to the North Pole, so it should show the maximum rotation. The second one is uh, showing the z-axis uh, towards the South Pole, and this should be perpendicular to the pole, so it should show minimal rotation. The next two are for negative controls. Uh, they face with the z-axis either west or face east, and these will show partial rotations which will cancel out. So flipping from one orientation to the other should lead to a uh, zero result. So the way that we collect the data from this experiment is as follows. The interferometer sits perfectly stationary in a particular orientation, in this case first in the south orientation, and we collect a baseline signal for about 5 to 10 seconds. Then we manually flip the interferometer over to the perpendicular direction and then take another baseline reading. So we've got essentially a baseline, then some noise from the flipping of the instrument, and then another baseline. And this is how we compare the amount of fringe shift which has occurred from one orientation to the other. We can then use the millivolt difference between each orientation and our calibration data to determine the rate of rotation the device is experiencing due to the Earth alone. The negative control progresses pretty much the same way. We start with our baseline on uh, the east-facing configuration, and this is just showing the east-facing configuration here. We then uh, flip it over to the west-facing configuration and do a second baseline for ten, 5 to 10 seconds, and we repeat this process over and over again, flipping uh, from one orientation to another, but keeping it stationary while it's doing the baseline. And uh, then we find out what the average millivolt changes from one orientation to another by doing about 20 to 50 readings. And this is just the details of our calibration. We did calibrations for the first and second experiments. The first experiment being 50 readings, the second experiment being 20 readings. 
And we have the experimental results shown in the uh, table on the lower half of the slide. Uh, essentially, we were expecting a difference of around 19.44 uh, millivolts in the first experiment for our full rotation, uh, and we got 21.76. And uh, for the second experiment, we were expecting about 65 millivolts, and we got 57.5. So we're pretty close to the expected values. And for negative controls, we were expecting around zero for each uh, set of readings and we got 3.1 millivolts in the first and 2.5 millivolts in the second. So uh, I think this was uh, fairly accurate uh, for this uh, first pass experiment with this instrument. What have we demonstrated with this experiment? First we find that the speed of light is slower counterclockwise and faster clockwise around the loop leading to our measured fringe shift, even though the interferometer is stationary from our perspective in the lab. Because we are detecting Earth's rotation, it means that the speed of light is constant in some other preferred frame, this frame being the Earth-centered inertial frame. Someone sitting on the North Pole would be in this frame. What this means is that for all other observers on the Earth, the speed of light is actually not constant at all. This implies that the constancy of the speed of light, which is a postulate of the theory of relativity, is very possibly an illusion.